let's hand over to our first speaker, which is Judith Gordon, who is part of Share Bristol, who have set up the first library of things uh, in the city. So yeah, Judith, if you want to take it away. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation coming to speak to you all this evening. It's lovely to see all your faces rather than being on a webinar where I can't see anyone. So hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to talk to you about our library of things, but I thought I'd set the scene um, just to so that I'm not assuming things of my audience and I'm not in the room. I can't see you nodding or rolling your eyes or falling asleep. So bear with me. OK, and if you do, um, if I'm going too fast or you've got any questions, as um, Dorian says, just pop things in the chat. Um, so I wanted to talk initially about our relationship with stuff um, stuff novelty is is great we want new and shiny things it's like in our nature as humans that we want to go and buy and acquire new things and so our things go through kind of three phases where they're goods they're in a shop they're in a lovely box they're all packaged nicely and they're really appealing we go and buy them we bring them into our homes and we unpack them and we use them once maybe twice and then we kind of forget about them and we look at them for months on end maybe years and they become clutter in our homes um, and then finally we decide actually that thing that we bought wasn't such a good idea and we we classify it in our minds as rubbish and we need to somehow get rid of this rubbish um, and this kind of linear relationship um, with our things is something that we'd like to break in the library of things and um, take a drill for instance so we've got a power drill i've got one behind me it comes not in a cardboard box but in a massive plastic case and made in China, this one. So not only has it been produced, it's been packaged, it's been shipped, it's come to our homes. Actually, I, I don't want to drill. I just want the holes in my wall. I just want to be able to hang a picture up. And yet for all of that, I, I need this. Um, and I don't know whether every home in Bristol has one of these, but it seems a bit ridiculous just when all we want is some holes. Um, so, uh, and when we're done with it, when we've hung our picture up and we've decided we don't want it anymore, we have to store it. And this is just one thing in our homes and we have many things that we don't use every day. And so these take up space in our homes and our homes become storage places instead of places where we live and exist and create. Um, and then we decide we don't need a drill anymore. It's charger goes, something breaks on it. We haven't got the skills to fix it and we want to get rid of it. Um, there was Professor David McKay, which um, the website um, for the West Bristol Climate Action references very well. Um, he said that um, he did a study. Um, sorry, he's the, um, I'll, I'll read his title. He's the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change in the UK. So this man knows what he's talking about. And um, he said that stuff, which is our clothes, our gadgets, our books, our furniture, our DVDs, is the single largest contributor to our energy consumption. This is above our use of a car. Um, so it's not an area to be ignored when we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. And as we all know, the world has a finite resources. Um, world Overshoot Day, in case you haven't come across it, is when, um, it, it's when we've used up our entire planet's worth of resources for that year. So this year, it happened on the 29th of July. So every day that we go past that, we're using up more and more resources than the, energy, than the planet can sustain. Um, the individual ownership of things as well, by me owning this drill, I don't need to speak to my neighbour to see if they've got a drill. It's taken away those interactions from the local community and that can lead to isolation and loneliness as well. Um, and we've talked about our homes being turned into storage spaces as well. And that sheer amount of stuff that we have, um, it can freeze us into inaction. These things can stop us from from living our lives because we get so bogged down with all this stuff that owns us and it, that can really affect our mental health as well so this isn't the world that we want to see so setting up the library of things is something where we wanted to take that goods to clutter to rubbish and break that cycle taking things that people have deemed rubbish in their own minds and bring them back to be goods where people are attracted to them want to use them want to borrow them again so we want our things to have their most potential um, one, so we want to use our things until they can no longer be fixed. So here at the Library of Things, we will repair things time and time again. A, a top item that's gone out um, this summer has been strimmers. I think after um, no mow May, everybody went crazy. Their lawns ended up two foot high and everybody was suddenly wanting a strimmer. 
So the strimmers have been back and forth. We've been fixing them, repairing them, and we've got three strimmers, one of which we think is at its life's end now, so we can't repair it anymore. But it's, ha it's had the most use that it could have had out of it. Um, so going to the Library of Things concept, because we're aware that that's quite a new concept for Bristol. Um, our Library of Things is a community resource. Um, where members can borrow the things that they need to live their lives. So that's things like DIY tools, gardening tools, it's kit for adventures, for parties, and then it's all the cleaning equipment you could possibly need for afterwards as well. And um, we make sure that everything that is donated gets checks, it's all safe to use, and um, it, it just, it's a system that works for people that people can have confidence in. Um, before setting up the Library of Things, we spoke to a range of people at pop-up events pre-pandemic when we were allowed to do pop-up events and we spoke to over kind of 250 people I think it was and we had 47 percent of people didn't know who they could borrow things from and a further nine percent um, felt embarrassed about asking to borrow things time and time again from people and the, this kind of formal concept of a library of things takes away those barriers that people will have a resource they can go to they're confident they can borrow anything they like and they can um, and they don't have to feel awkward about asking us for things, because that's what we're here for. Um, so the Library of Things allows us to turn our homes into the spaces that we want them to be. Um, we, we don't have to store the bulky items like pressure washers and steam cleaners. Um, we can live our lives without costing the planet. So we've got things like projectors for big film nights, you know, you can have a big screen. We've got karaoke systems. This week I've just um, taken charge of a churro maker. So they're like finger donuts, very nice. I never would buy one myself. It's not something I'd want cluttering up my home, but to have it as a special event, the kids loved it. We made an evening of it and it just helped us to make memories. Um, the Library of Things also empowers people. We've had people coming in to borrow a drill where they've had, they've used a drill in the past, but they just want to try and build something themselves um, and just build their confidence. And we also want it to be accessible for all. So no matter what your income is, no matter how shy you are about asking things, we want this um, library to help those people. And um, some of the equipment we've got, you know, a, a good, a decent steam cleaner, you know, 200 pounds, a pressure washer is about the same, a decent sewing machine, you're talking 100 pounds. The, this prices things outside people's income. Um, so we make that affordable for them. And we're also, we're based on the high street. So we're, our pilot um, site is in Kingswood. We're right on the high street. You might hear a bit of traffic outside. It's brilliant. We're getting drivers going by, going, um, and people coming in going, I've driven past you so many times. I want to find out what you're about. I'm really intrigued. So we're finding that we're actually able to speak to the um, people driving their cars rather than being a destination where only people who are kind of keen on the environment come to um, see us. Um, so we've had so many great conversations here with the public um, from all walks of life. Um, we've got people who joined us from local community or are volunteering with us and they bring with them their personalities, their stories, and they just bring this whole um, concept to life. We've got our members that now, we're seeing them returning with their stories about how we've helped them and they're stopping for a chat. So the community feel as well is really coming into play these days. Um, we've had 111 things borrowed so far since we opened in May. We've got 71 members, so we're slowly growing bit by bit. So we're hoping to increase that over the, the coming months and years. Um, the idea is that we will have a network of library things across Bristol. Kingswood isn't that accessible from the west of Bristol. Um, so hoping in time to move closer towards you. Um, and just that this isn't a crazy concept that we've thought of here in Bristol. This is a worldwide concept. There are so many libraries of things across the globe. The numbers are going out of date on a kind of daily, weekly basis. Um, our nearest um, friendly um, library of things in the area, we've got one in Bath, we've got the original one in Froome, and then um, Cardiff is also growing a network there. So it's becoming more and more popular across the UK. So hopefully we'll get more and more popular across Bristol as well. Um, so I was going to do a quick couple of minutes on how this actually works. Um, so the things are donated to us. This is, I'm in the library of things now. These are all the things that have been donated by the local community. So we look for good quality things and we do all the checks on them that we need to. Um, people buy an annual membership. So they become a member of the library, a standard 
price is £50 and then there's concessionary of £20 if £50 is too much, if you're on low income, um, if you're on benefits, anything, you get to decide your income. And if you are feeling a little bit flush and you want to support a bit more, we'll take £80 off you, we'll take full on big donations, you know, we won't, we won't say no to any money coming into our pockets, um, but we want it to be accessible to all, so do come and speak to us um, if any of that's a problem. Once you're a member, you can borrow anything for free. We, we didn't want the conversations to be about money here. We wanted them to be about borrowing and about the, about the climate. So one-off payment, everything else is free. So you can come back every week, borrow whatever you want. Um, so we do all the checks. We do initial checks, making sure everything, the electrics are pat tested. We make sure everything's clean, everything works. Um, so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, and we've got then insurance as well in case anything goes wrong. And if you break anything, then that's fine. Just come and have a conversation with us. Everything's been donated. And if things have run their full lifespan, then that's the way it is. Um, so, and if there's nothing in the catalogue, if you're looking for something specific and we haven't got it, it's a community thing, have a chat with us. We'll see if we can get hold of one. And um, we don't want to be buying new, but um, where we can help it, but we'll try and source one from the community in case somebody's got one in their home that's clogging up their house. Um, so the final bit was, what can you do now in terms of um, sharing things? If you want to borrow things, um, you can join the library of things. I'll pop some links into the chat in a minute of kind of the, the links that I've got. Um, I'm aware that the library of things isn't very local to you, so it might be a logistical problem to get over here. But if, if you are able, if your work or your life brings you over towards East Bristol, then do join. Um, if you've got some spare time, we'd love some volunteers. We're hoping to, we're just open on a Saturday at the moment for a few hours. We'd like to open up more in the week on a Tuesday morning or a Thursday evening. Um, so if you have some time and can get to Kingswood, we'd love to hear from you and see you. Um, if you want to see a library of things in your area, it takes a good few months to set one of these up, we found, um, just in terms of getting premises and getting the funding in place. So if you have any leads on anywhere near you that would be a great place to be, that's high street, that's busy, that would really attract attention, um, we'd like to hear. So I'll drop the email in the chat as well. Um, but on a more immediate level, I suppose, is just next time you think of you're going to buy something, something that you think maybe you won't be using very often, um, just see if you can borrow it, whether it is from a library of things, you know, whether Cardiff's easier for you to get to or whether we are, um, whether a neighbour's got it, whether um, someone on a local Facebook group might be able to help you out. Um, also, the West Bristol Climate Action website's got a great page on um, circular um, economy. Um, and there's lots of links on there that are really local to your area um, that will link you up to other organisations that can help you as well and help you to lower your stuff carbon footprint as the website says um, so I would encourage you to borrow not buy and if you can get to the library of things we would love to see you whether you just pop by for a chat even if you can't be a member but if you'd like to be a member and borrow then that would be amazing too thank you very much thank you so much uh, Judith that was great um, I said we'd do all the questions at the end but Joanna's asked a, a really good one which I'm just going to put to you right now it's just what do you accept as donations to the Library of Things? And they're sort of, I'm going to put this on the end, are there any broad categories of things that you can't accept or won't accept? Yeah, so broadly we're looking, um, Library of Things, people will borrow things for about a week. So we're not looking for things that are long-term loans. So we're not looking for bicycles or anything that kind of needs a, a longer amount of time. So things that can people would borrow for a week. So we've got like DIY tools, like task-based items. We've got things like croquet sets, gazebos, you know, those kind of things. Um, we've got a wish list on our website of the kind of things that are still outstanding that we got from other library of things that we're setting up. So we're working off their wish list. And we've also got some things like our carpet cleaner is so popular at the moment that if we could get another one of those, that would be amazing. Um, things that we wouldn't take would be petrol things on the premises. We just don't want the, the risk of fire and explosions. So um, we have battery operated things where possible or plug in electrics. Um, and then bulky things. So we're looking for household items rather than industrial machines. So if somebody had an industrial lathe, we wouldn't be able to take that because it's not something portable that people can easily carry. And we don't have immediate outside parking, so weight is something that we're quite um, aware of when people are offering us donations. Great, yeah, fantastic answer. Okay, 
Thank you so much, Judith. Let's move on to our second speaker this evening. Uh, his name is Andy Hibbert. Uh, I meant to look up his specific role title, uh, which is he is the founder of CarShare. That was easy. Could have remembered that. Probably could have guessed it. Uh, but so yes, Andy, would you like to share your screen and uh, yeah, your part of the evening away? Yeah, listen, thank you very much, uh, Dorian. Um, sorry that you're leaving Bristol, but glad you're coming to London, which is we've got operations in London too. Um, so look, a warm welcome to everyone, and thank you for offering us the opportunity to talk a little bit about car share. I think we've got 20 minutes, so um, as Dorian suggested, we'll go through a presentation. Uh, unlike, I think, Judith, with, there's got lots of things in the background, we couldn't get many cars here, so we've done a presentation. So I think Judith is more interactive, and I love that. Um, and actually, Judith, it's a shame. I, I just wrote down, I've got a strimmer, although it's petrol. Um, and the, the irony is, I had that strimmer I bought when I was 13, when I was doing my little local gardening rounds. I used it for a year or two, and then my, it stayed in my parents' house for, the, for probably 20 years, and it stayed in my, my garage for the next 13. And it's just the sort of thing that is literally cluttered. I'm thinking, one day I might need to use that, and I thought I could give it to you, but as you don't do petrol, I, I know I can't. But I'll, I'll dig some other stuff out, I'm sure there is. And I think what you're doing is amazing. So car share, let, let me just talk to you about car share. Um, Cause obviously, you know, we, this is about sharing economy. So what is car share? Um, some of you may know or have heard of car share. We, we did actually launch in Bristol um, at the height of the pandemic when we realized that everyone was in lockdown and cars were doing very little. And we, we, we I suppose reached out to the hearts and minds and the kind souls in Bristol and asked them if they would be willing to give their cars for free so we could enable frontline care workers to do more and reach more people. Um, and that's how we launched the business effectively, you know, at a time when car sharing was, was definitely not something you would be doing. Um, but I suppose in English terms, what do we stand for? We're a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform um, aimed at solely serving communities within the neighborhoods and the airports. Um, so essentially sharing cars with one another um, those that have them that are not using them that want to enable other people to get access to a car when a car is necessary. I think we're staunch supporters of active travel. So uh, I think in a lot of our literature, we rather you kind of walk, you get a bike, get a bus. But we do understand that in certain situations, a car is needed. And when people need a car, we believe it could be accessed with a shared car rather than just solely through ownership. Um, just to sort of clarify, um, in Bristol, there are car clubs that exist. Um, so here are some names that I'm sure um, many of you will be familiar with, some maybe not so familiar with. So Zipcar, Enterprise Car Club and Co Wheels all definitely exist in Bristol. Um, they've been serving Bristol and Bristolians for some time, giving people access to um, cars, you know, when they need them effectively. The difference being is that um, we are only activating privately owned vehicles that are sitting on streets and driveways, you know, redundant, not doing much. Whereas these businesses actively own a fleet and they put them on the street so they can be shared. So they're doing a really good thing because they're giving people the chance to access a car. Um, I suppose much like the library of things, it's more like a car that can be accessed with other people. Um, but we believe, I suppose in a different way that there are lots of cars already sat on our streets and driveways doing nothing. And, and I think as Judith mentioned, it's kind of our job to change the mindsets around how we can go away from sole ownership of things to actually using things and sharing things. So we're part of the sharing economy. Um, the sharing economy, um, as defined by the Sharing Economy UK, defines itself as, um, I guess, allowing us to unlock the value of assets, connect with our local communities, and to increase productivity by enabling people to trade their space, their skills, and their stuff. So I think really the library of things is a, is a perfect example of, of trading stuff and using stuff again, you know, getting more life out of the stuff. Um, so these little emblems kind of effectively sort of talk to different businesses. Airbnb, I'm, I'm quite convinced that a lot of you know what Airbnb is. Um, there are lots of derivatives of, of homes uh, kind of being shared, rooms being shared, full homes being shared. The second one is parking. So just park again in Bristol. So that allows people to actually share their redundant driveway which is you know in big need in certain cities where car parking is is chronically under um, uh, under capacity and there are problems there so sharing a driveway with people who want to park is a really uh, good business model um share my boat that's obviously what it says you know people who can't afford to own yachts and boats can share other people's um the poor is a business called borrow my doggy um i think that's one of the most incredible businesses i know that 
people who have dogs would rather lend them out when they're on holiday to people who love dogs and care for dogs than put them in a kennel. And we always thought if people are prepared to sort of loan their dogs out and let other people dog sit them, then we think that other things, a car included, is more easy to share because it's just not emotionally attached to it in the same way. So that's there, that there's, there's um, tent share. Um, there's other businesses that are really growing now in popularity, particularly around clothes. I mean, there are some that younger people actively get involved with. So Depop is, is you know, a, a platform where young people can sell on kind of their clothes without using it and buy from other people. Um, and fast fashion, as you all know, is, is a really, um, it's one of the second biggest thing, fashion produces CO2 in the world. And it's, it's horrible to think that much of the fast fashion that is bought, tried on and sent back actually ends up in landfill uh, rather than back on the shelves because the, the cost of folding it and reputting it back on the shelves is more than actually just throwing it into landfill and because it's so cheap to produce it's creating a, an awful problem so that kind of reusing and resharing and let, loaning out clothes is a really big growth business that has a lot of good to reduce co2 there's your drill judith so that is you know exactly what it says it's it's a library of things so whether it's a drill whether it's a strimmer uh, I think you talked about a, a, a vacuum cleaner, um, a, a carpet cleaner, sorry, an ice cream maker, a churros maker. These things are amazing because we all buy them, you know, occasionally because we think they're useful. We use them once and never again. So the whole concept of sharing those things out is amazing. And then, of course, at the end of there is a car. Um, so we're all about sharing that final asset, which is a car. Um, and, and I'll show you some of the facts in, in a moment. So I would guess in summary, yeah, we enable private car owners to rent their cars to other people living nearby. Fundamentally, when those cars aren't being used. Um, so why do we do that? Why do we think that's a smart idea? Um, so just a couple of did you knows. Um, I've got a picture here, which actually is Bristol. Some might recognize it. Hamilton Road in Bristol. All roads in Bristol look similar when we've been down there and our team who live there and operate there and support the business there. They are ram packed with cars. Um, that's an area. Um, in Southfield, and Southfield in particular has a chronic um, car parking challenge where local residents struggle to park cars on their own streets. Um, but these are the facts. There are 38 million privately owned vehicles in the UK. Um, so that's vans and cars effectively. Um, but no matter what you own, the average car is only used for 4% of their life. So for 96% of their time, their whole life stage, they end up parked on our streets, on our driveways, probably turning most of our streets into a mass car park. Um, so that, that we think is crazy. And a lot of these cars parked are uh, redundant, yet we're buying more new cars all the time. It's a, it's a very expensive item to own. It costs on average £5,000 a year to own. So, you know, an asset we spend a lot of money on that we then stare out the window at most of its life. It seems like a pointless exercise if we carry on that way. And there just simply isn't enough space to keep producing new cars. Um, also making a new car, um, it produces three years worth of road emissions. I'll come on and explain that in a bit more. And the very fact that many of our streets are now sort of parked up with plenty of cars there's no space on them when you're searching for a car parking space it can add to the congestion of any city you know bristol in particular has a as a kind of um, under capacity of parking um, problem and the congestion can be exacerbated by you know, from nine to 56 percent depends on where you are um, just because people are spending on average you know seven to ten minutes trying to find a space um, and that's where car sharing can really help so we think we can help support a much more sustainable solution in cities and for people to access cars that can do so much good. This is just simply, I guess, that whole equation about a car production. I think, you know, there were different cars, a basic spec car, maybe six tons of CO2 to produce. A Ford Mondeo is like, an, I suppose, an average car is 17 tons to produce it. Um, a much bigger car, a Land Rover Discovery can take, you know, 35 tons. So it's a lot of CO2 consumed and the carbon footprint in making a car is, is, is really complex. I mean, ores are dug out of the ground and metals are extracted. These are turned into parts. Other components have to be brought together, rubber, tires, plastic dashboards, paint, everything. And transporting all those things together to an assembly line to put the car on the road is immense. And that, that is against a running of a car on average, you know, a family car would produce 4.6 tons of CO2. Now that's not great either. But the simple point is, is that if we can start to use the cars that are on the street more and actually do more with, with less cars, we don't have to produce so many at the start. So we're all about trying to enable, I guess, you know, Bristol, the UK and other countries to, to achieve more with less cars. That's what car sharing we think can do. 
Um, we know it works. Um, there are many kind of um, studies that have looked at car clubs, as I mentioned, Zipcar and others have been around for 20 years or so. So they can see and they can evidence now that sharing cars can help to reduce the cars on the road. So they know that every shared car can take 10 others off the road in certain places up in Edinburgh. They've, they've actually shown that they can take up to 25 cars off the road where people have previously owned cars, have opted to then move into these car clubs or car sharing systems and have actually opted not to renew their own cars. So they've actually you know, rescinded their, their car ownership, their parking permits, and they're getting cars off the road. Um, and this is like not simply something that, that, that happens there. We know that councils such as Bristol, they want to reduce car ownership by up to 50% by 2030. So this net zero 50 and, and many of the accelerated councils trying to get there quicker, have these ambitious targets to reduce car ownership in their minds by 50%. But you know, how are they gonna do that? That's 210,000 cars, currently parked up all in the streets of Bristol. So can you imagine if there were 105,000 cars less? Um, I'm, I'm certainly looking at the audience and seeing there are people around my age um, uh, you know, who may remember when they were kids playing Kirby in the streets. You know, so you know, two kids playing a football across the street trying to bounce on the curb. You couldn't do that today because you can't see the curbs. But imagine if half the cars were not there, half the streets would be empty of cars. You could repurpose that for pramways, for walkways, for roadways, for cycleways, for all sorts of different things, you know, a much better way to get active travel moving safely. Um, we've certainly seen since car share has launched, you know, with its, with its application that enables people to share their cars with each other, that some car owners have actually elected to get rid of their cars and become renters. So we know this is happening within our own system. And for renters who effectively use the system, there's a picture of one there, we sort of giving them the impression, impression that you have got a garage of cars in your pocket. So no longer do you have to buy a single car. You know, everyone jokes about London and, and the Chelsea tractors, you know, people driving around in big Volvos or big BMWs to do the school runs because they need a big car to do a holiday up in the Lake District for two weeks. And it's like, you know, what, therefore that car is then used to go to Sainsbury's to pop to the shops. It's crazy. But if you have access to a number of cars, you can access a small car, an estate car, an SUV, a van, a convertible, something, you know, just to go and see your relatives for the weekend, a small car, when you need it. You don't have to be wedded to one car. So getting access to that range of cars, we think is really exciting for, for users who no longer need to own a car. Um, and actually the car sharing itself, those who share cars, they, they get very organized. So no longer do they use their car to pop here, there and everywhere. They do their things in a, in a consolidated fashion in order that they can then provide good availability of the cars to be rented by those nearby. So we know that it actually reduces the overall trips when people share their cars. So how does car share work? How do we do this? Because obviously I think Judith, you talked about the awkwardness of turning up to borrow things and actually your wonderful kind of um, sharing facility and it takes that away because you do that for a role and people love to come and they can see access and, and grab what they need. Um, but car sharing can be really complicated. So how do we actually enable a renter to access a car? Um, I thought it was easy to show you through a short video, it's about a minute and a half, but it explains kind of what we do for an owner and then how renters can access these cars in a really effortless fashion that enables it to work really without any friction at all. Sharing your vehicle on car share is safe and easy. You'll be ready to rent it out to drivers in your area after a few simple steps. Once you've signed up to share your vehicle on our website or app, you'll be invited to select a date for your key collection. A member of our team will stop by to borrow your spare car key to prepare our keyless technology for your vehicle. Our keyless tech is essentially a small black box that plugs into your OBD2 port, allowing renters to securely unlock your vehicle using facial recognition. We'll send it back to you in time for a car share representative to install the technology in your vehicle's dashboard. It'll be tucked away nicely and you'll be good to go after just 30 minutes. Once our keyless tech is installed, you can decide your sharing settings, pick your own rental price, or take advantage of our smart pricing, which adjusts according to demand and set your availability and mileage so you can have full control over when you want to share your vehicle. CarShare's keyless technology ensures that your vehicle is always safe and secure. Renters are vetted and insured by us and can only access your vehicle using facial recognition technology. They're also required to complete a condition report and check the fuel and mileage levels before starting their rental. Advanced telematics 
keep track of renter behavior like acceleration, braking, and more to ensure they're driving with care at all times. Once they've completed their rental, they'll return your vehicle with the fuel replenished and in the same condition they found it in. After submitting their final condition report, your vehicle will be ready to rent again. So that's probably the best way to explain what we do. I mean, the keyless technology sounds complicated and it really isn't. It's just about using the spare key. And rather than having a key you put in the door to turn the lock or even a, a blibber you blip, we make the phone kind of the, the key and we, we put the box in the car, which is like the barrel. So we just enable that to happen through a mobile phone. And, and many of you may, or some of you may know, some may not know, but, but all cars that are coming off the production line are gonna to start to be share ready. I mean, companies like Volvo already have a system in Holland where you can lease a car from Volvo and it is available to share on their platform to people nearby. So the world of automotive manufacturers know that car sharing is the right answer. Uh, we're effectively retrofitting existing cars to make them really easy to share because we know that where there's a key, there's friction. If people want to access a car, it's much easier they can gain access when they need it. And then for owners, they don't have to be wedded to their car if they really want to support this car sharing, kind of pioneering it through their own localities and neighborhoods. So what drives us effectively is to create a world where we have sort of no more cars than we need. And I think we don't know the answer whether it's half the cars on the planet. There's a billion currently on the planet. I know I mentioned 38 million vehicles in the UK privately owned, but there is a billion on the planet right now and they're all only used 4% of the time. So whether we can reduce that by half, we don't know, but we're, we're determined to make it so that people can access cars more easily through car sharing. Um, and in that, we have a vision to power and help support the move to net zero by making it easy to use a car without owning one. Um, just to give you some, some simple statistics, we when we were sharing cars at airports pre-COVID, um, Gatwick was one, Bristol Airport was another, um, we had probably about 2% of owners who were choosing to park their car and share it, you know, which is phenomenal. You, you go to a website, Gatwick Airport parking, you choose long stay, you can choose short stay or valet parking, for example. And then there's this crazy um, option, which is called rent and earn. And after a period of two years, we were getting repeat customers and they were really enjoying the fact they could park, share their car, make some money and take it home at the end of it. So they were really wedded to that. So if we translate that to owners in the UK, 2% would give us a fleet of 640,000 shared cars. You know, 2% of Bristol would give us effectively 4,000 shared cars. Um, but just to give you some context, if we enable that throughout the UK, that will be three times more than all the car rental companies put together. So that's Hertz, Europe Car, um, Avis, um, all those, and Zipcar combined, it would be three times bigger. And the really lovely thing about it is that when those cars are shared, the money that is driven from renters into those owners stays in the community. So those people in those communities benefit because that can be shared locally with other local community businesses. And I think that's a really lovely thing about the social return. It's not kind of putting money into big corporate people. It's putting the money back into people's pockets in their, in, in their communities and your communities. So this is kind of, you know, where we, we want the planet to be, you know, we want to reduce the number of cars on the planet by a significant amount. So, we can stop choking it, A, because of the production um, of making those cars, we can have fewer on the planet. But B, over the evolution of our sharing, we do know we have to move through the different transitions. So sharing a car and getting the mindset to share is the first part of that. Once we've got people to share cars, obviously we want to get more uh, sustainable cars shared. So electric vehicles is a part of that component. We have a number of vehicles already in, in Bristol that are electric. Um, but we tend to find that people are less um, willing to take them because they don't understand them enough. You know, what happens if I run out of electricity? Where do I charge? How long does it charge? All the questions that we need to be answered and supported with better infrastructure. But over the course of time, and certainly in the next couple of years, we know those things will improve and we can help to drive then a shared fleet, which is driving towards an electric fleet. So that's car share. I hope that's interesting. And I, I imagine there are some questions, but if I'm sort of finishing now, I'm looking forward to... to to take in those questions. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Andy. That's uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, uh, what I'm gonna do now is just quickly uh, flash up my screen, um, if that's okay. So I think if I just do...
that. I'll throw this back up just for a moment because I know some people hear the speakers and then they sort of decide, oh, I've heard enough, I log out. So I'll just quickly remind those people uh, to do, please do check out our website. We've got all of those different fun resources and activities going on. Um, you can donate via the PayPal link in the middle there if you enjoyed tonight's talk. Any donations are gratefully accepted. Um, and special reminder to please uh, send us an email if you would like to come to our planning meeting uh, Monday, October 4th. We will be planning how to go things, how to do things in the future uh, with our volunteer capacity slightly reduced with me moving to London. Um, but yes, we've got a few questions in the chat already. If you've got more, please do type them in and we'll try and get to all of them. Um, I think I'm, I'm just going to execute a little bit of uh, host privilege. Uh, and ask Judith a quick one, which uh, is, what do you do with items that get donated, which you, I don't know, test for instance, and find that they can't actually be lent out? Do you, are you able to recycle those items? Yeah, we take those to the sorted centre. So we're in South Gloucestershire, so we'll take them to the sorted centre so they can be recycled. Okay. Okay, cool. I just, I had a nightmare uh, when I moved recently um, with taking things to the tip, the dump, and believing I could recycle all these wonderful things. And then the guy just going, nah, just stick them in there. They're not going to do anything with it. And me just getting very, very upset and depressed about it all. Um, but yeah, good to know that you're not just getting everything. Right, actual questions from real people. Um, uh, hang on, right, that's more than I realised. I got a longer... A bit more scrolling than I thought I needed to do. Uh, right, yes, okay. So the, the next question, which uh, you may have already seen because it was asked while you were speaking, uh, well, what sort of legal requirements are around lending items? You mentioned pat testing. Um, yeah. but, uh, what other sort of loopholes are there for an item to jump through before it can be lent out? Okay, so we just, we have be responsible for the things that we lend out so they have to be checked by somebody who knows what they're doing if you know, particularly electrical things we can't just have you know i wouldn't i wouldn't be checking drills i have no idea about drills um you know if things need opening up then that's i'm not the person to do that so we make sure that our volunteers um are able to look after the things that are donated if they can't we will outsource so if something needs a specialist look at we'll get somebody in um, so it's been responsible, making sure that we've got the right people checking the right things, um, making sure that they're in good order, making sure that we've got user guides associated with them, so that if you've got any questions or all the information that you need to use it, um, and then pat testing is um, good practice for the electrical systems. Um, so it's not lots of hoops for us, but it's um, enough. Our insurers are very thorough in terms of what we need to do so that they'll cover us. That answers. Question? Muted myself. Yep, no, I think that definitely covers it. Thank you. Um, uh, Pippa asked whether you had a garden shredder, and you've already replied and said that you do. Wonderful. So if you need a garden shredder, you know where to go now. Um, someone was asking, I think this is about car share, is there an option to only share your car within a certain area or with a certain group of people? Uh, she lives in a small village. Um, I think there was some conversation about this in the comments, but do you want to answer that, Andy, just sort of what sort of options there are for people? Yeah, in, in short, we, we are enabling that already, um, albeit in a slightly different concept. We have smaller operating sort of systems in Strathall in Scotland. Taliban is quite close, which is in near Brecon. Um, we call, they're like micro communities in a way. We haven't, we don't yet limit people to come in and use those, but we're looking at closed user groups. So for villagers and particularly who want to do this, they want to rally around around three or four cars and then 150 people want to share them. So we're looking to do that. We don't yet do it, but we know it's, it's something that we'd like to do. And it's a really good idea because I think those communities want to stick together and operate their own. Um, some communities want to do that, but, but and, and have a, a good low, cost valuable solution but if people come in from outside they're still happy to rent but they, they'll put the price up effectively so different systems again um so it's a, it's a great question we don't yet do it but we're certainly looking at how we can do it great um and another one for you was about insurance if policies are attached to cars rather than drivers uh, is it a challenge both to arrange uh, and especially if a car is damaged during a rental 
Yeah, so the insurance, I mean, it's a great question. The insurance is the toughest part for us. Um, in, in short, we insure every single car and every single renter during the rental. So we have a blanket insurance policy that goes up to Group 45 that covers us fully comprehensively, um, third party liability up to 20 million and you know protects the renter, the owner's car and the third party effectively. So the owner's car insurance themselves isn't in, in, uh, impacted at all. Um, most car insurances will say we don't permit you to share, which is why we take over the insurance and cover the car for the duration of the rental. So that's essentially how it works. Um, that, that's how it works. And, you know, we work closely with our insurance companies and the, the main insurance body to make sure that that starts to proliferate through all the organisations um, so they understand it. It's, it's very misunderstood. Um, but we know and we've got um, all the authorities that say that what we're doing is absolutely right and you don't need permission to share your car from your insurer, insurer to do this. Okay. Um, I've got another one for Andy. I'll go to a Judith question just to keep it fairly mixed. Um, Judith, I, Julie's asking what sort of premises you have for your current library of things. Thinking specifically about West Bristol, our high street premises would be be expensive so what other kinds of premises could we try and look for if we wanted to try and get one for our area yeah it's a good question so um across the uk we're one of very few who have high street premises and i think we're the only ones who are pay paying high street rental prices we've done a lot of forecasting to make sure that we can work and can sustain that so we're not getting premises for free when we're, we're not you know in bath they're on a one month notice period and they're getting their premises for free but they have to move at a month's notice um, whereas we can stay um for the next five years certainly um so what we're also looking at here in kingswood is sharing our space with other communities to become a um, community organization for real community hubs so they can help us to share the rent as well so we're up for a patchwork of things to make the finances work um, so it is about location um, we would look at the figures coming to the area if an expensive retail premises is what it is and I think we're after the change in people's mindsets and we're not going to get that if we're tucked away on the back street somewhere so we're, we're really carefully considering where we can go I know it doesn't answer your question if things are expensive you know I, know, I hear Clifton's and cheap you know um, yeah, we'll, we will consider all and make sure the figures stack up before committing to anything. Great. Yeah, no, I think being on the high street is fantastic. Um, yeah, no, well done. <laughs> um, right, so the question for Andy was, do you have any figures on whether people who use car share end up saving money compared to owning their own car? Yeah, I've just, I've just done a little calculation here. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so it, it's owning a car. We, we use the figures for car ownership in the broader sense from people like the RSC and the AA, and, and they claim it costs on average £5,000 to own a car. And that's a combination of parking, MOT, servicing, insurance, um, as well as the depreciation of the asset over time. So that's the cost of the car. And when people sort of seldom use cars, they might choose to, to not own a car and to rent it like, you know, over four times in the month. So they could use it for four periods of time, you know, go to see somebody or pop somewhere to do some bigger shopping. Um, so the average cost of a car is about 40 pounds a day. It depends on the car type. Some are cheaper, some are more expensive. We have premium cars, at 100 pounds a day. And we have, you know, simple full Fiestas at 25 to 30 pounds a day. Um, but for that, it's 160 pounds a month. If you wanted to use a car four times, if it was five, it'd be 200. So that would cost someone about two and a half thousand pounds to access that car or those cars um over the course of the year so it's half it's half the price of ownership in that regard and it just depends on how much you use it i mean as i said we want to promote active travel and if, and if people actively seek walking cycling scooting using public transportation but use the cars for the times when they have to go somewhere that doesn't have a direct link on public transport they could save a lot more they really could so i think it's we're part of an integrated sustainable kind of transportation network and it's just important that we know in some occasions, if you want to use a car, access one, it would be a lot cheaper. Definitely. Um, one reason that some people give for not wanting to join a car club is that they are afraid they won't be able to get a car at the 
peak times, uh, such as when people need to commute. Um, is this an issue you've had? And have you found a way to deal with it if it is? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I think the challenge that car clubs have, so this is like a Zipcar, Co-Wheels, Enterprise Car Club, is, you know, Zipcar has been going for 20 years all over the world. And even to date in, in the world, they've got 18,000 cars on the planet. So in the UK, they have um, three and a half thousand cars to share. In Bristol, they have about 48. So when you're an owner operator car club, it costs a lot of money to buy a fleet of cars to put them on the streets to be shared. So they can't grow quickly. And that's the big problem for trying to scale those businesses, which is why people can't rely on them because there isn't a car on every street. And when the car isn't there, they lose trust and lose faith. So car, peer to peer car sharing like we are has the best opportunity. I and mean, we have probably more cars in Bristol now than all three car clubs put together. Um, and we've been, we've been operating there for a year. And of course we're putting new cars in, I mean, Amanda's on, the, on the, the line here. She's helping to grow that awareness in Bristol. So we just want to make sure that people have access to cars and a broad range of cars in their neighborhood, wherever they live in Bristol. So it's a journey we're on. We, we haven't sold it yet because there isn't enough cars to, to, pro, to provide everybody with that same confidence. But we're building clusters in Bristol, which gives people access to more cars. And every week we have more. So I think in two or three years, we'll have solved the problem quite differently by giving people the ability to go out to get a pint of milk or go out to access a car. And actually, there'll be a great range of cars within five minutes from your, from your doorstep. And that's where we, we want to get to. So, get, you know, over time, we'll solve the problem. And we'll be able to do it because... There are so many cars in Bristol, 210,000 that are parked on the streets. You know, as I mentioned, 2% of that will be a fleet of just over 4,000. And that eclipses, you know, zip cars 50 that have been operating in Bristol now for sort of five to 10 years. Yeah, no, of course, more cars, easier to grow. I, yeah, makes complete sense. Um, I think we've just got one question left. So if anyone else has got any more, now is the time to stick them in the chat or you will miss your opportunity. Uh, and right on cue, there's another one. Um, yes, one for Judith about uh, initially setting up the Library of Things. How did you get money to get started if you're paying retail rental prices? I mean, that's quite impressive. Yeah, and the banks were all closed during the pandemic. We weren't going to have to nip balaclavas. Um, so, yeah, we did have to go for grant funding. Um, so we our initial money came from um, a funding platform called Brevio, which is a new platform, which in case any of you are running other um, local organisations, they um, try to match up community organisations with funders. So you fill in one application form and put down your funding needs and they match you. So we got... Um, a three thousand pounds from them initially and then we had um we went in for a your voice your community your voice vote so we put our idea forward against ideas across the whole bristol area that was run by sovereign housing association um and we, we sorry loud traffic going by that's the high <laughs> so, street um, for you yeah it's the high street <laughs> everyone's out um so we put in, with six days before the deadline, we spotted this pot of money, put it in, and we managed to get, I can't remember, it was um, nearly 300 votes, I think, for it. So they gave us £5,000 and um, were able to offer free membership to Sovereign Housing Association residents. Um, so that's been a really good um, link with them. And then the third pot of money came from South Gloucestershire Council. Um, they were doing money to help revive the high streets called Help Us Thrive. So we were able to get £10,000 to really boost our high street model here um, to get the signage up, to get the technology in that we needed. Um, and then there have been some private investors. We did a crowdfunder, which brought in another £3,000. Um, and then we've had our memberships have been rolling in as well. So it's all piecing together. I've got um, next month, I'm going to be heads down writing some more funding bids to try and get some more longer term partnerships with um, grant funders so that we can really grow because we've just recruited our first employee now. So we have to start being grown up and responsible. Funding bids are kind of thing that sends shivers down my spine. So I do not envy you, but uh, I wish you all the success. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just one more question for Asha and Andy, um, is Bristol City Council or are any councils for that matter getting involved in promoting car share? 
that that's a that's a really good question um yeah so Leeds City Council are the probably most proactive council we've got who are now driving car sharing um in in their city we're only launched there this week um Coventry City Council um with the Transport for West Midlands have got a mobility credit scheme whereby they're asking owners to not repurchase to sell their cars and for not buying a car they get credits which they can use on car clubs and car share so they're really actively promoting us as a solution which is wonderful because you know we're there and we've got ability to, to put cars where they need them through the local community um bristol and coming back to bristol they i think they have a really strong transport strategy and they've got really ambitious goals it's quite hard to get engagement from them and i'm not pretending that they're being awkward but it, it's kind of actions for us speak louder than words and i think at the start of this you know i was saying to to nicola about you know we've got to do everything we can to get the community moving a support from the council is even a quote and we have had a quote from um, from um, the mayor he's been kind enough to give us a quote which we've used we have had a chat with him on one of his facetime drop-ins face is it facetime it's one of those live live videos he has so there is active support there it and i guess we just have to keep sort of pulling and pushing um, there's nothing that says um, um, they will give us distribution to their, their residents. They did help us join Car Share Free, so they did actively um, get us on, a, on an email distribution to ask Bristol Bristolians if they would be help, help to provide cars to support the care workers. So they have done that too. So they have been supportive. Yes, um, we would always we'd, al we'd always wish for more. Um, so we'll just take what we, we get and we'll we'll use it as much as we can. But yeah, if there is more that's that's um, forthcoming, then we'd be delighted for it. So we work with that, but it is it is it is slow progress. Sure. Yeah. No, we have some experience of trying to get the council to do things and then being obstinate. I think that's the right word. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm glad that they are supporting you because sounds like a great idea. Um, We've got, we usually finish around half past and we're about three minutes away from that. So um, I'm going to leave the last question that Julie's just put in there about whether the council is supporting a uh, library of things, because I imagine it's quite similar that they're sort of supportive, but could be doing more. Um, but yeah, I'd like to give you both the opportunity to just quickly little, rattle off some links if people want to find out more. Um, and uh, you're on muted, so why don't you go first? Is that me? Sorry. Yeah, if, you, if you're ready, if you've got uh, uh, some links people can follow if they want to uh, find out more about Karsha. I've just put the website in the in the chat, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say that's a good place to start. There's lots okay. of links from the site there. Yeah. Um, I mean, just just if you look for Karsha in Bristol, there's there's an amazing amount of content that, that Bristolians did to help get the movement going. Um, but I think, you know, we always we'd always We'd love more owners to do this, absolutely. If you know other people who will do this, who are keen, I think you know, that the video that video you've seen is on the, on the homepage. We find it's a, it's a good one to, to explain to people how it works. It unlocks a lot of theories and people always ask about the insurance. So even there, how does insurance work? It's all part of the content on the site. So rather than throw all the, everything up here, mm. I think that's just you know, a nice starting point, but I yeah. really appreciate people just taking an interest and in looking in the first instance. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, the benefit for anyone who's uh, watching this on YouTube and isn't able to access the chat, it's carshare.com and that's carshare with a K, I guess, because it's an app and something has to be misspelt. It's just, <laughs> so it's, the, assume the logic is behind all of these different things. Um, but no, great. And uh, Judith, um, I've seen you put some links into the chat as well. Things.sharebristol.org.uk, is that the best place to start? Yep, that takes you to our library where you can browse everything. So you'll be able to join there, browse what we've got without without joining and reserve things once you are a member. We've also, I'll put into the chat now just um, our full website um, and also my email address. So the full website is www.sharebristol.org.uk. You can email me at hello at sharebristol.org.uk. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for coming tonight. Uh, really, really great talk. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's inspired to see what else I can lend or borrow. I've got a, I've got a fan 
I never use it apart from maybe a week out of every year. So maybe maybe I can lend that. Um, that's the best suggestion I've got so far. But yes, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we will probably be back uh, towards the end of uh, October. We generally do these on around the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, we don't have next month's book yet. The best way to keep in track of uh, what we are planning is to follow us on the website or join the mailing list, which you can also do through the website. Again, that is westbristolclimateaction.org.uk. Excuse me, just .org. I should really know that by now. Um, westbristolclimateaction.org. And uh, yes, check out all of our links, PayPal, everything else. And uh, yeah, we will see you for the next one. Thanks very much.